But the reason why we're here today is to talk with these three wonderful people, with uh, Anna, uh, Dimitri, and uh, Jeremy, who I will be very happy to introduce very soon. And uh, Anna, Dima, and Jeremy are three of the expert coaches of our uh, collab, this collaborative experiment. And we will be discussing with them what we have learned from this experience, what they have noticed about the power of this collaboration, what is the value that they think opportunities like this provide to newsrooms, and more and more that we will get on over the next minutes. So that's the quick intro, and I'll get to it. I'm very happy to see, again, these happy faces and not my own uh, slides. Before I start the conversation, actually, with the coaches, we invited uh, one person per each of the uh, collab teams that have been working together over these months to give us a sense of what they have been working on and also to provide you with a trailer of what's to come, because each of the four teams will host one session as part of this uh, festival where they will share in depth what they've been working on. Uh, before I pass it on to them, very quickly, just about the collab. As I said, it's a global collaborative experiment. And each of these three words is very important because the collaboration point is what started us. We heard from newsrooms in our report, research report last year, that there was an eagerness to collaborate around uh, AI that was quite unexpected in a sense uh, from us. And we wanted to test this uh this interest for collaboration experiment because we didn't know exactly what it, may, it meant to work collaboratively on ai to be honest so we were lucky to have these more than 20 news organizations being very open to join this experiment with us knowing that nothing was sure in terms of the outcome maybe but that there was going to be learnings throughout the process that they will be able to share and global because as much as maybe the geography of our presenters today won't show much geographical diversity, because three of the four are from the Nordic countries in Europe, uh, but still, this was an incredibly global team, and the value we have seen from this uh, diversity of people joining from different cultures and backgrounds has been one of the key things of our collab, which we will discuss in the rest of the conversation. That's it for my introduction. So I'm very excited to have the four of them here. So we will get them to do a very quick and challenging, I think, one minute pitch to tell you what to expect from their sessions uh, over the week. And I will, of course, go following the schedule. So I think the first one up tomorrow, Tuesday, is our team one, as we call it internally. So Agnes will tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, hi. So I'm Agnes Stemble from Team One of the Journalism AI Collab and the Nordic Media Group Shipstead. On Tuesday, so tomorrow, I will be sharing my team's learnings from exploring how AI can be leveraged, help us meet one of our industry's biggest challenges, our need for increased diversity. Join me and my team member Issei Mori from Nikkei tomorrow to learn all about our research and experiments in this pressing field. That was, what, that was even less than a minute. Incredibly well done, Agnes. And going on with the calendar, on Wednesday will be team two. So it's Chris telling us about it. Thanks a lot. Then I have a little more time then. Thanks, Agnes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Christopher Heggett, and uh, please call me Chris. Uh, I work as uh, head, uh, head of editorial development at Altinget in uh, Denmark and Sweden. And uh, I'm so lucky that I can represent team two of the call-up. Uh, and on Wednesday uh, at five uh, Central European time, yeah, it's difficult all the, all the time zones, I know. Uh, I'll be hosting a session together with uh, my colleague from uh, team two, Florencia Coelho. Uh, from La, La Nación in Argentina. Uh, and this session will be about how to make use of all the vast, vast amounts of, of content uh, that's not news anymore, uh, um, all the archives. How can we leverage this with, uh, with AI, via AI? Um, how to better identify evergreen and uh, how to, 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 to support the news production uh, with AI and so on. So um, please, please join us and, uh, and learn more on uh, Wednesday. Thank you, Chris. 
That's wonderful. Next up for Thursday is uh, Roman, who has an interesting task because it needs to summarize the work of two teams who actually decided in the end to join forces and present their results together on Thursday. Go ahead, Roman. Exactly. exactly. Thank you, Matthias, and good even, good good morning, good evening, and a good day for everyone, depending on your time zone. I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm part of the SAS China Morning Post news organization. Um, and as Matt mentioned, I've been working with Team 4 and Team 5, uh, but they are sharing similar uh, core, um, core core topics. And one of the core challenges that we haven't identified for news organization is how to improve um, news organization uh, and their engagement with audience. Um, so they can better target them with content, offers, advertising, and subscriptions. So basically what we have looked uh, with the, within the teams is how can AI help us build audience engagement and loyalty. So for that, we have looked at different aspects. We have looked at churn, how we can identify a churn to be able to prevent it for our users that we identify at risk. We also gather together a playbook around loyalty with some metrics and KPI and use cases on how to build loyalty um, with AI. We also try to look at uh, an idea around gamification. Would that help with having higher engagement uh, with our readers? And finally, we have a look at content recommendation, how um, AI-powered content recommendation can help recirculation and better engagement across different platforms. So that's going to be Thursday, um, 7 p.m. Hong Kong time, but 11 a.m. GMT time, London time. Sorry, I didn't do the conversion. I think it's going to be 7 a.m. New York times because there is exactly 12 hours difference with Hong Kong. Um, but feel free to join. We will be more than excited to, to share that with you. Thank you, Roman. I couldn't have chosen better presenters. They're able also to turn time zones on the fly as they speak. Well done. And we're going to finish this round with uh, Ole telling us about the presentation that their team will give us on uh, Friday, on the last day of this festival. Yeah, hi there, everybody. And my name is Ole Sakerson from the Swedish Radio, and I represent Team 3 in our collab. And on Friday at 11 o'clock GMT, that is 12 o'clock Central European time, you will hear me and Christina Elmer from Der Spiegel talk about AI summaries and especially how they can be used in relation to quality journalism. In our study, we have tested a couple of summarization tools in different languages and in different formats. And we think that we have some pretty interesting findings and recommendations for all newsrooms and others who are interested in automated summaries. We also have conducted a big ABCD test on Der Spiegel's website to find out if summaries are a good way of attracting readers to journalistic evergreens. So tune in for more on AI summaries on uh, Friday at 11 o'clock uh, 11 o'clock GMT. Thank you. This was excellent. Thank you, Ole, and thanks to the four of you. Of course, we are super excited to follow your sessions over the week. So as you all know, following us uh, online, uh, the festival has three tracks, and one specific track is about the collab, and this session today is opening that track. So make sure that you check out the program on Journalism AI Festival. Uh, dot, uh, com, where you will be able to find all the details. And again, if you haven't been able to write down the time zone conversions, you will be able to find there when what is going on online. So a big thanks again to uh, Agnes, Chris, Roman, and Ule for introducing their teams. And again, every morning as the morning London, I should stop saying morning really, every beginning of the day in the UK where we are based, we will share via our global uh, newsletter the links to their complete work that then they will present during the day. So stay tuned for a lot of content dropping in your inbox, a lot of interesting content, of course, arriving in your inbox over the next uh, few days. So this is where I get to the pleasure, the real pleasure of introducing our three uh, speakers for the sessions. And I will let themselves introduce themselves. I should be better at building sentences with my English. Uh, but what I want to say uh, is that uh, I already asked, so we prepped, we kind of cheated about this. Uh, I asked all of uh, them, and I will start with uh, Anna Yakimowska uh, to, of course, introduce themselves a little bit. And then we will explain their role as coaches. 
but we wanted to start by giving you a sense of their role, their background, and why we decided to have them as coaches for this collab, which of course they kindly accepted, by asking them all to define for us a little bit what is their relationship with journalism and with AI. Each one of them has a very unique story to share. Anna right now works at Culture Trip, a chief product officer, but of course she has much more to tell us about herself. So Anna, on to you. Thanks, Mattia. Um, thank you everyone for sharing your um, summaries um, and um, thank you for, for all, all of the uh, interested sort of people who are uh, following us on the live stream. Um, I'll, I'll do a brief introduction of uh, sort of my career so far and also I'll summarize where my relationship with AI sits. I am a product person, as Mattia says, currently I'm the chief product uh, officer in a startup called Culture Trip, which is uh, essentially content-based um, uh, travel e-commerce business, uh, doing a lot of experiments around content and AI in a non-hard news environment. So I've been there for a year and a half and uh, we actively uh, work on various parts of the AI uh, supported content commissioning, content maintenance and content creation. Before that, I've uh, been in the British media for about uh, 15 years I was, uh, before coming to Culture Trip, I was uh, director of uh, product at The Guardian for two years. Before that, I was um, head of product for Sky News. Before that, BBC, um, ITV, Channel 4, working pretty much in uh, every sort of uh, news um, kind of newsroom for, from the product uh, side for big publishers. Um, I, I love news, I love content, um, and big part of kind of my role has been supporting uh, the important work that goes on there um, and supporting the digital transformation within that. I see recently that AI is, should become a big part of all the digital transformation. My relationship with AI starts um, probably around 10 years ago. I, I did a PhD in AI um, on uh, reliability prediction using Bayesian networks. And I've always been very interested in finding the cross section, the intersection between content and AI, which is why I've gravitated towards the startup where, where I am now. I believe uh, content um, and news have an incredible important role to play in society. And we should help journalists and everyone involved with any sort of technology that is available to make that task much easier, uh, whilst feeling safe and secure and more morally and ethically right. Um, so um, I, I believe there's a very bright future for AI uh, within sort of the newsroom and, and in general in content, uh, which is why I'm in the startup where I am. Uh, and as part of this um, collab, I've been sort of privileged enough to, to be able to uh, sort of provide help to the groups for things that we've tried, frankly, that didn't work. So they, they don't waste their time or they learn something from that. I think those lessons are more important. And also to share some of the things that have worked for us, uh, especially in culture uh, as part of our assisted commissioning, maintenance and content creation. And, and I don't know whether I had one minute or not, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave the word to the other brilliant sort of coaches now. I didn't keep track of the time, so you did very well. Anna, thanks so much for the introduction. I always like how, especially in this context, you mentioned casually that you have a PhD in AI, which is mind blowing to me, but it kind of explains very clearly why we thought you could be well equipped to help the teams in the collab and equally equipped, although clearly in a non-PhD academic way, Dima, I will give it on to you to answer the same question. You're muted at the moment, Dima. Typical, right. Um, hi, everyone. And again, thank you for making this, making me a part of this wonderful project. Um, I'm Dimitri or Dima Shishkin, as I'm, um, uh, as I'm known in the industry. So I'm, um, I'm an editor by profession. Uh, I have been editor for um, a long time. Um, I'm currently working as an independent digital consultant for myself, um, having left Culture Trip uh, a few months ago and actually Everything that Anna has described um, makes me so excited because all the things uh, about content maintenance and AI help, helping with automated commissioning and lots of other things is something that I have been involved with from the beginning of thinking about this. And so I'm, I can't wait for Culture Trip to produce all of these results. So, but 
kind of unwinding a little bit back in terms of my background and why I'm interested in this and how I am kind of connected to this is that I obviously have been very, very in anything to do with editorial change uh, as part of my work at the BBC before. And uh, editorial change more often than not involves new ways of working and new ways of working um, in the next 10 years or so will definitely be about machine learning and AI and, you know, optimizing processes and automation and things like that. So kind of the intersection of me being interested in editorial things by profession but and experience, but also in all product things by experience as well. Um, and I guess kind of all of that sitting on top of the strategy and strategic choices that people, uh, um, organizations have to take. And my involvement in this has been um, mainly observing and sharing some of the bits and pieces that I see happening elsewhere and uh, how people could have used it during um, the, the uh, collab, collab sessions themselves. And one of the things which I'm particularly interested in is that just so happened that as part of my cons consultancy work, I am working on a particular AI enabled solution for newsrooms when it comes to digital analytics and how AI can actually create really smart notifications for newsrooms to act on them so the they can commission smarter and more effectively and this is a start of the project uh, a very useful plugin i'm going to publish a linkedin post about it tomorrow so you will learn more about that but i think i'm allowed to say that being one of the coaches anyway that's it from me thank you very much and thank you again again for making me a part of this Thank you, Dima, and of course, very much uh, allowed to share your uh, plugin there. We're looking forward to read uh, your article. Uh, next in line uh, is uh, Jeremy uh, Gilbert, who has also an interesting relationship to share with us about Journeys May I, considering that in the middle of his coaching experience, he changed job, as far as I know. So Jeremy will tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you for having me. Um, I represent a little bit of a hybrid. Essentially, during my time with the Collab, I straddled the profession in academia. So I was working at the Washington Post, where I focused on, among other things, how technology and journalism could intersect. And we spent a lot of time looking at ways that AI could help with automation within the Post. So that was across a variety of things, including the creation of content, but also around the moderation of comments, around finding patterns to detect stories, around better, smarter distribution of journalism. And partway through, I left the Washington Post to join Northwestern. I today am the night chair for digital media strategy at Medill, the media and journalism school at Northwestern. And I supervised Northwestern's Night Lab, where engineers and journalists work together looking at cutting edge technologies and how those technologies, including artificial intelligence tools, can help journalists. And also work across the university, trying to find ways that similar approaches that we use in journalism can work in other domains, like computer science and medicine, law and business. And so what I tried to bring to the collab was a mix of things. What is the history at the post like in terms of a applying artificial intelligence solutions to journalistic problems. So, you know, what works in one newsroom might it work in another, but also how do academic approaches to finding and, and structuring information apply to this kind of work? And I really do strongly believe that some academic work is purely theoretical, but a lot of the academic work as, as Charlie and I, for example, have talked about can be very directly applied to industry problems. Thank you, Jeremy. That's another excellent prime for our conversations to come. So thank you all for introducing your fascinating, of course, background, which was the reason why we kindly ask you to join this collab experience. Uh, in the next few minutes, we will get to talk about that specific experience. So I want to hear what you have learned. I'm actually very curious what you're going to share. Uh, I thought about uh, quickly going through a quick history of the collab, kind of to complete the uh, background of what this experience was and where you uh, enter in this. So if I'm able to share my screen in the right way, once again, there we are. So you should be able now to see my tab loading with uh, the Journalism AI Collab uh, website, which again, everything can be find, found at journalismai.info. This is the space, uh, the homepage of the Collab, where over the week, sorry, we will link 
to all their um, stories and the products that they uh, produced. Going back for a second, the collab actually launched from this sim for a simple idea in April of this year, when we published a post explaining why we were launching a collaboration and really asking our community to share some of the challenges they were facing in the newsroom and that they might have been uh, interested in exploring solutions for with AI. So there was a very open questions and we were very interested uh, in and very curious about to see what kind of questions we would receive. Uh, and lots of people got in touch, luckily. So we talked with many news organizations from across the world, many of them ending up being part of this uh, collab. And uh, with them, uh, we went uh, through a few brainstorming uh, sessions to really narrow down those challenges. And then we created these famous five teams that now this week are down to four because of two of them deciding to merge their outcome. And in early June, we actually launched the collab properly. Uh, at that point, uh, the plan was simple in a sense. We have five teams, we have five challenges, we have five to six months. Let's see together what kind of solutions we can, if not create, because of course the timeline was very short, uh, what kind of like experiences we can gather so then we can be able to bring them back to their own uh, newsrooms and use their learnings there, as well as sharing with the entire global community and industry as we're doing this week through the festival. Of course, at some point, we also asked ourselves as we were having these five teams, what is a team without a coach, really? And that's where the three uh, speakers we have been joining us today, Anna, Dima and Jeremy came in, I must say, not only then, we also had Alisa Teisler from the Wall Street Journal and Lisa Gibbs from AP. So it was really a stellar lineup of uh, coaches from this collab. And uh, they joined over the summer, uh, not to be assigned to a specific team, but really kind of to roam through and uh, talk with the teams and share with their experience uh, what could be useful for these teams to uh, know. Uh, and also kind of help the teams process their thoughts from their editorial experiences as well. So over the next few months, the collab has many things in this 2020 has been about this. So it's been about a lot of meet calls about all uh, joining us. We were having regular check-ins with the entire team. And although I haven't been able to capture a very happy moment, maybe of the collab, everyone looks very focused rather than happy. But this image kind of shows you the incredible um, global element of this collab, because you can see people joining uh, the call as part of the collab from literally every continent uh, of the world, from Argentina, India, uh, various countries in Europe, uh, uh, San Francisco, Hong Kong, of course, and so much more. And obviously, in case you haven't noticed, here they are, the free speakers of today. They joined all the calls. They were really, really, really helpful. And the teams can confirm uh, this. And today, we want to kind of go through with them what uh, it was their own experience. As I said, over the week, you will get the full results of this uh, collab of the four teams. Every, one, every team will have their own website where they will share their studies, reports, results of their experiments that they have run, as you have heard. So keep following and keep uh, checking the links that we will share in the newsletter uh, to get to consume all this great amount of content that they have produced. But back to the session now, where we start the conversational uh, side of this. So the questions that we want to approach are many, and obviously there's a limit to what we can do in about half an hour. And of course, we want to receive your questions, and I'm talking with you people listening to the live stream. So know that there is the Telegram channel at t.me slash journalismai to drop your questions, as well on Twitter and social media as well, using the hashtag journalismai. And before we get to the Q&A, though, I want to have the pleasure and use the opportunity myself to ask some questions to these three amazing people. And just to get us started and really get your sense of what was your collab experience, uh, I wanted to start with uh, uh, just one of you. Let's start with uh, Dimitri, in this case, just to flip the order and really just ask you what were one or more moments that were specifically important for you during these months to show why this kind of collaboration was important and it really made it clear for you what the teams and the participants were getting out of it? Well, I think um, 
it's very rarely where I would disagree with the founder and CEO of Spotify, uh, Daniel Ek, but I think I will disagree he, with him on one thing where he said once that innovation doesn't happen at desks. And I think that actually in this particular case, actually this might be just wrong because I think that we all have not been together and we all have been completely decentralized and we have been working um, uh, in, in our own you know, rooms and everything else. But actually, the fact that uh, people made it work and people made it work in one of the, probably the most challenging years that we all had had in our professional lives, um, that was really important. And that serendipity of thoughts um, that is really important for any type of collaboration and the ability to work across disciplines and, um, and really collaborate and really find the communal vocabulary between each other and, uh, and to actually present what we're going to see this week for me, it was really, really important because I, I knew that it would be very challenging to deliver something as an, an, a working prototype or you know things like that. Maybe due to the the way how everything has been set up, because we you know the kudos to people who have been able to do you know that uh, wonderful A B C D test that I can't hear, can't wait to hear about. But generally, you are discussing really. Um, ephemeral things, right? You're, you're discussing something that really needs to be somehow converted into practicalities and practicalities that would make sense for not only the participants of the collab, but actually you can go back and explain in one sen sentence what you have been able to achieve to as many newsrooms that have been taking part in many newsrooms that are clearly now sitting and listening to this. So I have been a big, big supporter of this collab from the point of view of um, if you are a small publication and you will never ever be able to afford any type of AI or machine learning um, experiment, but you will be able to hopefully at some point to go to some kind of AI or machine learning aggregator or provider of solutions. And this is what I think for me was the biggest, biggest takeaway that you don't need to develop everything yourself for yourself, but you can actually go and learn from others. So for me, this was the biggest, biggest thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dima. Anna, I was coming to you because, as you mentioned in your introduction, you had some direct conversations with some of the teams. I believe one of your one of the case studies that you shared with them will be included in a final report of one of the teams. I was wondering, from your perspective, like what did you notice in those conversations, and what did you uh, learn? If there was something in particular that you found interesting, or that make you think about new opportunities that AI might be opening up for these newsrooms and any newsrooms really in the world. Um. Yes, I would, I would echo what, what Dima said. I think the kind of the power of the group just um, sort of came together really, really strongly. And also the way that the collab is kind of being managed, we have to kind of some, well, probably now is the time to say uh, sort of amazing work, both Charlie and Mattia in sort of harnessing the kind of collective power of this incredibly sort of uh, diligent community who genuinely wants to solve problems via AI. Um, I was having conversations and I've also had my team uh, at Culture Trip having conversations with groups um, two and four and five around their areas. And the observation that I had was, and in, in particular I can mention a few examples. So one was around how you harness the, what, we, what we, we call an evergreen content and, and how do you uh, help AI sort of um, come, come together with uh, this evergreen content. And the, the biggest sort of takeout that I could share is that prepping the content with the right structure, structured content is extremely important when it comes to doing anything with AI. Um, and uh, it was sort of very interesting to see how close to all of the, to understanding of each part of the process, all of these groups had, and perhaps what was missing is a little bit of that sort of quick iteration, because we know that newsrooms are very busy and, there's always a, a project that will trump some of the R&D. Uh, so my observation was that the thing, the first, the right problems were identified, and that is around how the evergreen content can be used to help and support the revenue sort of causes for uh, for the newsrooms and support the kind of hard news and the journalism, and what you know what are the the, the levers that that can be taken in that sort of respect and it starts with tagging the content in the right way to actually understanding how to produce it and see if, if ai can help produce that content um so those the understanding of the problems uh was absolutely there and you know sort of quite a mature way uh, so that was one observation which was really really useful um, and the second one was around the kind of recommendations and uh, engagement. Again, very mature understanding of the problem space, 
what I did find that I could I could probably provide is uh, the executional part because um, that still remains for most of the organizations a part of the problem that the smart people are there the understanding of where AI where AI can support is there what is is problematic is having the resource to to kind of do it at pace and being at a startup somehow that that has had a bigger accent working with Dima on on um, these problems um, has sort of enabled me to understand what works, what doesn't work, and some nuances around the actual logistics. And just to add to that, Dima and I both come from sort of traditional publishing background in a culture trip working together within a year, we've managed to accelerate significantly the sort of AI um, uh, initiatives around content. And that is probably one of the biggest lessons that, that came out from most of the conversations about how brilliant the kind of the talent is within within these new news or publishing organizations and news organizations and that just a little bit of a push with the resource front would just would make a sort of incredible leaps thank you Anna. you raised lots of interesting points in there and i saw jeremy and uh, dima nodding uh, through so i guess we have a lot to unpack in the next few minutes but i think Jeremy, I think it's perfect to address to you also the question or the issue of implementation in a sense that Anna was mentioning. Obviously, for the collab teams, this will be something that hopefully we will be able to continue to work with them next year as to how to be make into some practical results the ideas that they have developed this year. I guess from your Washington Post recent uh, perspectives, what would you recommend to the teams or what you recommend them already by working as a coach with them to think strategically about how to go through that implementation problem? I mean, I think when I look back on my experience of being a collab coach, there are a couple of really positive things that give me great hope. And there are a couple of big challenges. And you were just alluding to the biggest one, I would argue, which is implementation. Um, but I will say, one of the things, if there is a positive to this really challenging year, as I cannot imagine any other experience in which we would have gotten so many people to be willing to, to commit to working with each other across time zones, the uh, very cruel screenshot you took of me very early in the morning without much coffee. Um, no, but th th we knew, I think we all knew if we were really focused on AI and journalism, that there were different people in different organizations across the world who were doing really interesting things. and. Pre-collab, we were in a place where once or twice a year, we might meet up by accident at a panel, at a festival somewhere across the globe and talk about how great it would be if we tried to solve these challenges together because we truly do face the same challenges. We also never would have done it because we never would have believed that working over video chat and Slack and other distributed ways would work. And so in that way, even in the pandemic, we actually were able to do something that we might not have been able to do truly outside of it. And so I view that as very positive. I also view it as very positive that there are so many different people who are thinking about the challenges faced by journalists and journalism newsrooms, whether they're on the revenue side or the content creation side, and thinking about how, at least loosely speaking, AI can solve those problems. I will say some of it is definitional. I think a lot of what we've been talking about in the collab are, are really automated solutions. Some of them truly require artificial intelligence approaches and some of them just apply, require thinking more smartly about how we can automate parts of the business that probably we could have done really before this latest generation. We don't need GPT-3, for example, to solve a lot of our problems. The, the technical solutions are out there. The biggest challenge that I see, especially as it relates to implementation, is the fact that very, very many smaller newsrooms and even some larger ones don't have dedicated staff working on these kinds of automation and artificial intelligence problems, and that even in the places that do, the conversation we're still having are among people who already are convinced that automation and AI technologies are the solution. So the collab group is amazing, but they're people who came to the collab working on already these types of problems and are then gonna go back to their organizations having already been convinced and now further convinced that they need to do this. The challenge is, just as personal computers in the 1980s and 1990s were a requirement, not an option, but lots of people in the newsroom refused to view that, I think automation and AI techniques are gonna run into implementation problems because lots of people in the newsroom are not yet part of these conversations, only the people who are already convinced. Further, and the last part of the implementation challenge is that 
most of the people in our collab are people who are less technical. Some of us, like Anna, have PhDs, but most of us do not, including me. And most of us are not computer scientists or engineers. And so when these really clever prototypes and approaches get back to the newsrooms, how are we going to find the support to actually build functioning prototypes where we can prove that these ideas that we have actually work? I think it's doable. I think the next phase of the collab or the next phase of these projects absolutely has to focus on that because we need to be able to show people back in the newsrooms that these approaches work and they produce tangible results. And then people who don't know much about automation or artificial intelligence will start to believe. It actually, um, forgive me to but butting in, but I think that it's, this is such a crucial point that I think it actually highlights um, something that we have been discussing for um, a few weeks or months lately. It's about the future, again, uh, indicates that there is going to be a amalgamation of content and product functions in the in really real, real kind of forward-looking organizations where those conversations where you don't really necessarily need to uh, influence e each other or the other side, as it were, because you can be the other side. And, you know, we have wonderful examples from, you know, Washington Post, where Kel Kate Mulder has been, has gone from product back to editorial, or we have Media Tran in Texas Tribune, who has been editorial all her life and then became CPO there. I think those types of things where you don't really, as soon as organizations stop having those internal silos or internal fights with each other because i think jeremy is completely right it's not an option anymore right and we haven't even mentioned synthetic media and i will stop at that i think we can have a dedicated session about that in the next festival <laughs> Dima, together i think actually some of the points that jeremy was uh raising are of course part of the conversation that we had with the uh, uh, collab during this time and i was especially interested uh, in uh, uh, talking about a bit the idea of the language issues that might be so how we talk about these technologies i mean we tend to talk about ai as an umbrella term but obviously we know that we're talking about many different things at the same time and still using language as a label to define the problem there is an element of how do we communicate as jeremy was saying between different departments about this how do we make sure that ai is not just something that the technicians are working in in a corner of the uh, media building organization uh, but also that editorial is involved so i just want to hear if you have anything to expand on that maybe jeremy and also to dima and anna i'm curious if from your experience from both a regular, well, a regular uh, legacy newsroom and then in a more startup environment, is there any difference that you have seen or even something that news organizations could learn from uh, media and tech startups in the way they manage to involve more departments and speak better about these topics? I can certainly open this part of the conversation. I think that often when we use artificial intelligence, we use a term so broad and so ill-defined, even within the discipline of computer science, that it can be confusing to people. We're not, Anna's work in particular is a really great example. We're not asking machines to suddenly understand everything there is to know about a story and make smarter recommendations, resurface content, put point journalists towards new stories. Anna very explicitly focused on what do we know about a story? How is it structured? What is the metadata around not just the holistic story, but around individual components of the story, pieces of information? Why? Because different artificial intelligence techniques require different understandings of what's already there. It's not that the machine suddenly reads and views the story the way a human would, but rather if you give the right inputs, the machine can help you do things that would otherwise not be possible in terms of speed or in terms of scale. So when we talk about AI, what we're really talking about are natural language processing. How do we understand words or phrases within a document? We're talking about um, machine generated content or synthetic content, which can be positive and can be negative. We're talking about different ways that we can help scale what a human would otherwise do. There are great examples from investigative journalism about how you can find patterns or stories within data. There are incredible ways where, for example, at the Washington Post, we had tremendous success in smarter article recommendation or better ad pairing. So there are lots of different ways that artificial intelligence can help us. But we need to be more specific about what's the problem we're trying to solve and what's the technique that we're trying to use to solve it. I, I completely, completely agree with everything that Jeremy said. Um, just to answer the question around the difference, um, 
I guess to, being being at this startup that um, has always had sort of using machine learning, I'm going to use the right term, um, assisted sort of mach, uh, computer assisted sort of decision making systems and machine learning. Um, that was at the DNA of the kind of startup. So every sort of hire would understand that we're doing something interesting within that space. And it would attract people who have been convinced to Jeremy's point that this is the right thing. So when it came to actually talking about uh, what do we do, it wasn't whether if we should do it, it's kind of when and how and how fast. And as sort of basic as that sounds, that is really, really important. And that was across the organization. Uh, the difference with sort of more traditional media is, I think, twofold. One is the point that Jeremy made, which is throwing AI around as a term uh, that we should do something with AI is actually kind of quite detrimental because if you took a look at journalists and ethicists and sort of smart people in the newsroom, they are they are processing the the kind of impact on AI on societies, given sort of some of the um, lessons learned from from the big tech companies in a way that can be quite detrimental and of course they would they would approach it with caution uh, approaching it in a way that it assists the kind of newsroom and um and forwards the the processes and experiments in a way that kind of would would create efficiencies to start with or um would create kind of higher volumes of content that would be checked is the way to kind of talk about it in the right way and I'm not sure, you know, that the, the level of communication and understanding and buying is the same across all of the organizations. So that would be one definitely a big difference around uh, uh, startup and, and traditional publishers where in traditional publishers and broadcasters, because I've done broadcasters as well, uh, the buying is not as kind of universal as there would be in the startup. I mean, being at the startup where I am, I haven't had a single conversation about we're worried about X, Y and Z because we have the principles and it's sort of like, how do we do it? And it's, it's frustrating that, you know, we're using GTP2 and now we, fa we have to fact check because it embellishes. There's still sort of need for quality and that understanding is there because Dima would instill it into kind of his content team. But it's more about how do we go about some of the quirks that using machine learning algorithms does as opposed to whether we should be doing it uh, at all. And I guess with traditional publishers, there is that sort of question which, um, which still exists, rightly so, but it's sort of how do how does that sort of buy in on what is the problem that machine learning and statistical methods can kind of do as opposed to using AI for the sake of it? I think uh, I think there are three really um, interesting things that I have experienced in my career. So one has to do with the past, one has to do with the current situation, and one has to do with a book, which I'm always recommending right, left, and center. So I start with a book. If you haven't read Big Nine by uh, Amy Webb, the American futurist, you, you ought to do it because she's excellent at writing, finishing the chapters on all sorts of walks of life, writing the uh, pessimistic scenario for AI application, optimistic scenario and pragmatic scenario. And I think that we always will need to be thinking about this. From the application point of view, I mean, let's also be very, very open about newsrooms potentially being quite conservative generally, right? That, that's fair, I think. So whatever you are going to bring them, any automation, like forget AI, I think machine learning is probably a little bit more softer name for uh, any technologies that they might be a little bit, bit more um, open to, towards. But the, the point here is that when I was doing a project at the BBC about automating videos and creating lots and lots of videos that we can create with artificial voices uh, and narrating them, uh, and so smaller teams can create 10 videos a day rather than two videos a day like in the past, so the audience benefit was completely, completely evident. But the, at the same time, the newsrooms were very, very, very uh, concerned about this as if we would take the jobs away. But it was never about that. It's about actually automating and giving the audience, the journalists, opportunity to actually concentrate on something of high value stuff. That's one one point, right? So uh, bringing new things will always will have some kind of pushback from, from there. And that's to my earlier point about content and product need, needing to become one. And currently, for example, you know, I work with newsrooms in my current consultancy capacity and I and I I can't tell you how often the newsrooms are surprised at uh, some creative reviews that I do for them in terms of the, we call them deep dives, and they sometimes are very surprised about what works, what do doesn't work for them. We think that if we have 
given them uh, tons and tons of data that they somehow are able to process it on a daily basis. That's just not the case. And uh, they, everybody's busy. And that's why if AI somehow, or machine learning, is able to nudge you towards some of the more valuable snippets that you otherwise will be very, very tired to find out or see, you know, even your trained eye. If, if somebody will say, well, actually, you know, this particular user need, you write about this and this will be, be you know, four times more effective on X, you know, and I'm completely mentioning the examples. But, you know, those types of things, you suddenly say, well, actually, you know, don't give me all the dashboards because I'm overwhelmed. I have so much many more dashboards. But if AI can actually see through them and say, pay attention to those three signals that you need to pay attention today, and that would be wonderful. Thank you all. That's uh, th th that's super interesting, and it really, of course, uh, touches upon many of the things that we discussed during the collab. Uh, staying within the collab, I know uh, Ole, who stayed here with us after the pitch at the beginning of the conversation, had an interesting comment here in the chat, and I asked him to bring it up for you as a point of discussion. No, it, it was just uh, trying to reinforce your point, basically, because I think that uh, Anna and Jeremy and also Dima did made some really in, in interesting points. Because the challenge for, for us in a big bro uh, broadcaster isn't coming up with really cool ML ideas. It's having them being prioritized uh, uh, compared with other ideas in, in our uh, businesses, you know, in our companies because we have such a big kind of technical development deficit. There are so many things that we should have done years ago uh, that we have to prioritize all, all the time. So these really maybe cool features, uh, important things we can do, they are not prioritized because uh, at the end of the day, we have other more pressing needs. And so that was just my point. And I think it's the same in a lot of other uh, uh, organizations and maybe you have uh, some ideas you guys on how 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 we can uh, ap approach that or how we can come around that or how we can uh, persuade people it would be interesting to hear hear your thoughts uh, on that um oh, Dima go ahead no just just very very briefly sorry Jeremy uh, the, the, the point here is that um, any innovation or any uh, innovation is a very tired word, but any any new things that are important to business for one of the, the reasons, they always need to be sanctioned from the top, right? And the, the trick is to be um, far away from the management to actually keep doing those things, but at the same time being very close to the management's thinking every day about what, what, what is important, what's not important. So um, again, from experience, if you are presenting a problem uh, problem interface or problem landscape for, say, a CEO of your company, then you you need to have that uh, access to so the stuff can be prioritized. And then actually, you know, you, you need to find a way of prioritizing the tech, serving tech debt and creating new things. And the it's up to the new teams to actually ship new solutions very, very quickly. And then that is really important rather than kind of keep talking about this and kind of the, you will never ever have an ide ideal situation or ideal scenario about anything. But the access to decision makers is probably the most important for me. I was going to add that at the Washington Post, a part of our secret around success with ML projects or automation projects is that we often started with things that were lower priorities for the organization as a whole. That if we could prove in small ways, in areas that other people weren't watching as closely that we could have big success, then that gave us license to scale up to other areas. So the in covering the 2020 election, one of the things that the Post Newsroom and my old team focused on is how could they add better results to podcasts? Not just new podcasts being released, but old podcasts. Is there a big audience for podcasts? Yes. Is it as core to everything the Washington Post was doing on election night as some other things that might have related to tech stories? No. And so in that way, we had a lot more freedom because we were innovating around the edges instead of saying, we're going to stop you from doing the thing that you're most familiar with that you think is most important. Instead, we're going to dramatically improve the experience for people over here that you're not paying as close attention to. And in doing so, then we'll be able to get the credibility to bring it back to the core functions.
Um, I, I agree with, with both things. Um, and I would add just one, I wouldn't sort of repeat, I would add just one thing. Um, we've done very similar approaches to Jeremy's in the past. Um, the, I guess the, the challenge with that is that um, what we're finding now, even in the startup where I am, is the resource and the training and the deployment. So we have data scientists who are brilliant at extracting patterns from big data to solve a problem. And what we found was kind of the most time consuming and the most uh, challenging part is the actual uh, deployment. And that takes a lot of time and that takes specific skill set, which engineering doesn't necessarily have. So for example, where we are, we needed a machine learning engineers with Python experience to deploy the AI, the AI model and they kept breaking and it would take 45 days for them to update to, up, to update from the previous session. And those sort of things are not um, taken into, into consideration so much so that uh, one, of the, one of the ladies who has worked at, at Culture Chip, uh, ex-Google, paired up with ex-Facebook person and they're doing a startup around deployment of, you know, of machine learning um, algorithms, which I've supported wholeheartedly and I've sent her a Matthias way to get requirements from from me, I'm determined for the newsrooms to have a chance in this AI race. Um, and that is a problem that even if you do showcase by the algorithms that there's some really interesting results that these things are uh, kind of providing to make it sort of productionable, deployed and actually providing real user value at scale. That's where most of the organizations fall through because no sort of engineer without Python experience would, would kind of know how to fix it. So then it becomes frustration, then it sort of becomes shelved. So the, the, the real sort of issue is at a decision-making pro sort of layer, there's either a buy-in for it and the right resourcing, or you, know, you remain in that sort of we'll proof a case and whether we'll prove the next one. And that's useful, but I think th there, there would be a point where in the way that organizations had to make a decision around using CMSs, you know, and they all build their own, I'm hoping that won't be the same sort of mistake that I, I think it has been mistaken at an industry level, but there will be sort of these clusters of organizations and groups that will try to solve A, the kind of data science and algorithm part, but more importantly, the execution part, because we are struggling with that even now, and we have machine learning engineers. It's not an easy thing to do. Thank you all for the insights. Loads to think about for uh, newsrooms and useful recommendations on how really to start some, in some way with all these projects and the various things that are needed to be taken into account in order to manage this transition or adoption successfully to uh, AI as well. Uh, we are about to wrap up this session. It's almost time. So Charlie, I wanted to bring you in here to ask if you had any thoughts about the conversation we've been having, if everything, anything resonated with uh, your own experience in the collab, or also if you had another question to throw at our speakers yeah. to close. You're almost out of time, but just picking up on Anna's point there, I thought one of the things that occur, there's so many impacts, systematic, systemic impacts that AI is happen, having. And I think Anna's point is one of the most interesting ones that there may be other entities that are going to have to come into play. We've talked a lot about collaboration, and that's terrific at optimizing, you know, individual specialisms and experiences and sharing best practice. But I think there is going to emerge the same way we're going to see new roles in the newsroom of people who have a particular ability. I think that one is going to be absolutely key. The the, whatever you want to call it, deployment or um, implementation. It is a real skill in itself. It's not just a techie person meeting an editorial person and somehow bundling something together. I think it's, it's a specialist skill in itself. And it, maybe there's going to be startups that provide that kind of service. And this is not unique to our industry. Every industry has the same problem. It's just that some have got easier rollouts of the tech than others. And I think journalism is a particularly bumpy, uneven field. Um, you can't just apply a, a one size fits all. So again, uh, it opens up as many questions and opportunities as it solves. Thanks. 
Thank you, Charlie. It feels like this uh, idea of opening questions rather than giving answers is becoming the official thread of this festival. And I think that's a good thing, actually. Loads to food for thought for newsrooms and people in news organizations that are following us on the live stream. Uh, time's up, so we're going to close it here. A huge thanks, of course, to Anna, to Dimitri, to Jeremy uh, for this session and also for helping our collab teams throughout the year. Thank you to Agnes, uh, Chris, Ole, who's still here, and uh, Roman as well for giving us a preview of what's to come in their session. So feel, uh, make sure to check the Journalism AI Festival uh, website at journalismaifestival.com to find all the details about the next collab sessions and how. Thank mm -hmm. you.